Welcome everyone. We're going to start in a couple of minutes. All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on which time zone you're in. I'm Bortu Nunel. I'm the Energy Policy Director at the Institute for Policy Integrity at New York University School of Law. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar. Today's conversation is the third in a series of webinars organized by the Environmental Defense Fund and Policy Integrity with the generous support of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Environmental Defense Fund is a nonprofit environmental organization that uses science and economics to find practical and lasting solutions to some of the world's most pressing environmental problems. Institute for Policy Integrity is a nonpartisan academic think tank dedicated to improving the government improving the quality of governmental decision making. We use economics and law to support smart policies for the environment, public health, and consumers. Given our organizational goals, Bea Spiller at EDF and I have been working on a series of webinars highlighting the ongoing energy research supported by the Sloan Foundation. Our goal in these conversations is to bridge the gap between academic researchers and real life policymaking. With that goal in mind, each of these webinars feature academic researchers supported by the Sloan Foundation, as well as policy experts who work on these topics on a daily basis. We hope that these conversations inform policymakers with the latest insights from cutting edge research and result in better policies. At the same time, we hope that these conversations can help researchers identify open policy questions and help them better understand how they can focus their research for bigger policy impact. Today, we want to have a chat on a topic that is critical to decarbonizing the power system, energy market design. With new technologies and lots of renewables coming online, how do we think about uh, market design? Not just about energy markets, but every component of the power markets that also affect outcomes. Capacity markets, ancillary markets, transmission. What designs work? What designs need to be tweaked and reformed? How do these designs interact? Uh, as these questions are very near and dear to my work and you know, um, heart, I'm very excited for today's conversation. So without further ado, I would like to turn the microphone to Sarah Layden, who is going to be moderating today's discussion. Sarah is an attorney at Policy Integrity, and her research and advocacy focuses on economically efficient and environmentally sustainable federal energy policy, particularly with respect to FERC jurisdictional power markets and natural gas infrastructure. Sarah, the mic is all yours. Thanks, Bergen. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's panel. I'm excited to introduce, introduce our speakers. Today, we'll, we will be discussing new research and issues surrounding how market designs can affect clean energy outcomes, such as whether Changes to energy market unit commitment processes can address uncertainty in wind forecasting, how frequency regulation changes can lead to reduced carbon, emission, carbon emissions from energy market dispatch, and how removing barriers to market entry can help facilitate participation by new resource types. I'm going to give a quick introduction of our three panelists, and then they will each give a short presentation on their work. Afterward, we'll have a panel discussion to, to dive deeper into the research and the policy implications from their findings. Finally, we'll turn it over to the audience to answer any questions you all might have. Please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll ask them later. So we have three panelists today. First, we have Dr. Katherine Hausman, who is an Associate Professor of Public Policy at the University of Michigan and a Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economics Research. She is currently working on a multidisciplinary research project that examines the impact of storage additions on transmission system frequency regulation. 
Dr. Chiara Loprete is an associate professor of energy economics at the Pennsylvania State University, where her research integrates economics, optimization, and statistics to examine market structures that provide incentives for efficient operation and investment decisions in the electric power sector. She is currently studying the impact of variable wind generation on transmission systems. And finally, Valerie Teeter is the Deputy Director of the Office of Energy Market Regulation at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. She, is, she most recently served as Senior Manager for Federal Regulatory Affairs at Exelon Corporation, where she formulated policy positions on issues including transmission planning and electric infrastructure resilience. Katie, why don't you begin when you're ready? Um, hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so let me get my screen shared so I can show you some pictures and some graphs from our research. I assume you can see that. Um, so this research is joint with Jesse, who's a graduate student at Berkeley, um, an economist by training. And then Johanna and Jean are both engineers by training, and they are here at the University of Michigan, where I am. And this is um, thanks to generous funding, funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And what I'll be talking about is our work on spillovers from ancillary services to wholesale power markets. It was a lot of fun to do this research um, because I don't normally work with engineers, but of course we work on lots of closely related projects. So getting the chance to learn from them has been, I think, my favorite thing about this ongoing project. With more renewables coming onto the grid and more batteries coming onto the grid, also with extreme weather events that we've seen in the past few years affecting the electrical grid, ISOs um, and FERC have been changing how they think about and how they compensate grid reliability and resilience. And so what we're going to think about is how changes to ancillary services markets impact the behavior of generators in the much larger energy market. I think this audience probably knows all of this, but I'll define it just in case you don't. Um, what we mean by energy market or energy provision market is the market for electricity sales. So think day ahead or real time market for, um, you know, for wholesale power. What we mean by ancillary service markets are markets for reliability. So generators being compensated for some measure of con contributions to grid reliability. In general, economists like me tend to focus on energy markets. That's not entirely 100% um, true. Um, there are certainly economists who work on capacity markets and ancillary service markets, but there are you know, hundreds of papers on electricity, on like the generation market, um, as opposed to the ancillary service market. And we're gonna argue that ancillary service markets are actually really interesting and important. They're both important in their own right and we'll show that they're important in how they impact uh, generation markets. What we focus on is frequency regulation, a particular ancillary service market, in which generators are asked to adjust their output very quickly at small levels to balance grid frequency. What we're not gonna think about, although our work has implications for it, are reserve markets where you have supplies that are paid to not be in use, but to be quickly available if necessary. So we look at PJM, this very large wholesale power market in the Northeast, and we look at changes that they made to their frequency regulation market over the 2012 to 2014 period. On the right hand side of the screen, you see a small figure that shows you that there were changes in the um, frequency regulation requirement throughout this 2012 to 2014 period. And what we show with both the theoretical model and then statistical evidence is that generators responded to these regulation changes by changing their behavior in the energy market. Specifically, whenever the regulation, according to our statistical results, when a regulation requirement is increased by 100 megawatts, that's the capacity that um, the ISO says needs to be set aside to be able to provide regulation, we find that boilers generate around 400 megawatt hours less in each hour, and that that is made up for by combined cycle natural gas units generating around 400 megawatt hours more. There's some statistical noise in the boiler estimate, but not in the combined cycle estimate. And then other units, think oil-fired units, experience only small and noisy changes. 
So we see fuel switching, we see technology type switching, and most importantly, we estimate an effect that's much larger than the regulation requirement change itself. The reason for this, as we show both with additional statistical evidence and with our theoretical model, is that some generators need to back off from maximum capacity to have the headroom needed to provide more frequency regulation. So they back off a little bit. Other generators go from zero generation, so being totally off, to being able to have foot room to provide more regulation. And importantly, unit level minimum constraints come into play here. So generators don't go from off to like 10% of generation, they go from off to maybe 50% or 60% capacity factors. Um, the results of this imply a lot of things, I think, for policy and for the design of electricity markets and also how we study them um, as academics like I am. So first, just showing that ancillary service markets interact directly with generation markets in ways that I think academic economists haven't always taken into account in their papers. Second, that these minimum strength constraints can be important. This is not news to any engineers on the call, but this is again something that typically doesn't get modeled in the statistical estimates um, that a, a economists like me tend to look at. On the policy side, you know, renewables, batteries, and climate change, as I said at the beginning, are all leading to a rethinking of ancillary services. And specifically in PJM, not long after our time period, lots of batteries entered to be able to provide frequency regulation. What our results mean is that that could have had actually an unintended consequences of increasing CO2 emissions. So an example of where batteries, which you might hope would help green the grid, could actually in the short term make things worse. Which leads us to a broader policy conclusion in a world without, you know, like the ideal carbon emissions regulation that we might hope for, we need to be careful about unintended consequences of our policies, especially around things like new technologies or changes to electricity markets. Thanks so much. Um, Kiara, why don't you go ahead? So, let's see, let me see. Are you seeing my screen? Yep, we can see it. You can see it. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I'm very happy to be here and to briefly tell you a little bit about one of the projects that we've been working uh, on funded by the Sloan Foundation. So I'll start by giving you a little bit of background first. Um, energy markets operated by ISOs in the US have the two settlement structure that Katie was talking about with the financial day ahead market and a physical real time market. Increasing wind penetration poses a challenge for this market structure because day ahead wind output is uncertain and markets will work better if we have better information in advance about what the actual wind output will be on the next day. And that's because non-wind units take time to adjust on, on a day ahead time frame. The wind doesn't blow, for example, expensive but inefficient generation units will have to start up. But if the wind blows unexpectedly hard, some non-wind units will lose their spot sales in real time, but will have burned a lot of fuel just sitting idle. Both outcomes are inefficient and may increase the need for uplift payments. So what happens today after the day ahead market if there's new information about what the wind might do? A couple of things to keep in mind. First, ISOs use intraday commitment processes to change the day ahead schedules before the real time market as new information um, comes along. But importantly, these intraday processes do not uh, produce financially binding prices. Second, ISOs are required to forecast the hourly wind production at all wind farms in their region. And they do this using, among other things, local data feeds that are sent by the wind producers every five minutes. The aggregate wind forecasts for the entire system are publicly posted and market participants may use them to make and update their bidding decisions. So in a way, the ISOs are disseminating the aggregate results of the local information that is owned and, and provided by the wind units 
and market participants make bidding decisions given the aggregate results of this local information. The problem is that even though the ISO models are fairly accurate day ahead, they do not seem to be learning a lot of new information from 24 hours out to three hours. And this is shown on the graph uh, to the right here, which represents the average wind output forecast accuracy across wind farms, individual wind farms in ISO New England. The shape of this function looks pretty similar if you look at different hours, at different years, excuse me, or individual power plants. So as a result, excuse me, as a result of this, schedule adjustments can only really start about three hours ahead. Although it's entirely possible that energy imbalances may have been foreseen and perhaps could have been corrected earlier than three hours ahead. So here's an alternative approach which has emerged in Europe. Um, the alternative is based on sequential intraday markets. And this example shows the Iberian electricity market that consists of a day ahead forward market and then a series of rebalancing financial markets where participants can bid in to sell more or buy out some of their forward positions all the way up to uh, the real time. So a couple of things to note in the Iberian design, nothing disseminates the local information, but intraday markets produce financially binding prices that, that, that create an economic incentive for the wind units to settle their energy imbalances as, as soon as possible. So what do we see in practice on this market? This graph is taken by a paper by Ito and Reglan, the 2016 paper, uh, that shows that we actually do see an adjustment. Uh, that we do see that wind farms systematically adjust their forward positions in the intraday markets. And eventually in the last forward auction, they will have a financial position that is pretty close to what they will end up producing. As a result, the other non-wind units end up taking opposite financial positions and progressively line up with how much they're supposed to uh, produce in real time. So the question is which approach is better? And to try and get some insights into this, we propose to use optimization methods and experimental economics to compare two design, the current two-stage design with a central forecasting service that is in place in the US and a multi-settlement design, design with sequential uh, retrading. And my remarks here will just focus on highlights from the optimization results. So there's very little research to support the view that a multi-settlement design would uh, do better than the current two-stage design in terms of reducing uplift and system costs when transmission and other physical constraints of the network are taken into account. And so our first task in the project was to develop unit commitment and dispatch models that would simulate the hourly operations decisions made by the ISO in an actual network under the two designs. Based on the simulation outcomes, we could compare metrics like uplift, to, um, to compare the two, the two, design, the two designs. A few things that I, I wanna emphasize because they're useful for interpreting and, and reading the results. First, uh, we're modeling unit commitment and dispatch decisions here, not the bidding decisions, which are the focus of our human uh, subject experiments. The models are run on representative wind days that are weighted to obtain annual results. And, and, and this is common in, in um, sorry, in co-optimized energy and reserves, which is common in, in the US. The proposed design we consider has four intraday stages. Why four? Because we were given forecasts at four different look ahead periods before the real time. But an important difference with the intraday design that I described for the Iberian market is that we do include physical constraints of the network in every single stage of the market. And finally, this entire analysis is based on the wind production forecasts that are provided from ISO New England. And, and so it's entirely possible that by providing price incentives, market participants may actually 
uh, be able to improve their forecast accuracy further because they base their forecasts on local, more local information, but we're not able to capture this here. So just one final slide to give you some insights. I've provided here the link to our working paper if you're interested in learning more. But just in one sentence, what we learned from this analysis is that the multi-settlement design is actually more likely to yield higher annual uplift than the two-stage design. So on an annual basis, uplift is higher. Why? Well, there's a number of reasons. And again, this is all detailed in the paper. Generally, and in line with our expectations, the multi-settlement design does better than the two settlements when the forecasts become are, are accurate in the intraday stages and the forecast they get progressively close to the real-time output. This is what I described earlier. And so again, not a, not a surprising result. But what we do see is that when intraday forecasts are not accurate, for various reasons, I've listed here one, this leads to inefficient commitment decisions. For example, more units are uh, turned on, they're start up in the intraday stages, and then they operate at minimum output level. And once they're committed, they can't be decommitted. Co-optimization of energy and reserves, which was not a feature we had uh, thought of in the original proposal, gives very interesting insights because in a number of hours what happens is that base load units set the price because they're able to substitute energy and reserves so they're able to increase their energy production and decrease their reserve um, provision and as a result the market clearing price is lower than the marginal cost uh, of peaking units that require more uplift this happens in both the 2s and the ms design but in the MS design, you have more stages. And as a result, uplift is higher. And finally, if we have cases of units that produce, they have the same schedule production in both designs, but they just settled at prices that are lower in the intraday stages and the real-time stage in the 2S design. And as a result, we have higher, higher uplift. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and I'll say thank you in particular to the Sloan Foundation for supporting our work. My colleagues, Tony Kuznika and Mort Webster at Penn State and our wonderful research assistant who provided great help to, to do all of this work. Thank you. Thanks for that great presentation. Um, I'll turn it over to Valerie to give us a perspective from the regulator. Thank you, Sarah. And I want to thank everybody for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to this group on, on the importance of um, how research can inform policy decisions. I'm going to share my screen momentarily. Apologies. Um, again, one would think that I would be used to the technology by now, but it did take a moment. Um, okay. So again, my name is Valerie Teeter. I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of Energy Market Regulation at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, what I wanted to do before I jump too much into my topics is, first of all, to give you a couple of standard disclaimers that are just important for anyone speaking um, on behalf of um, uh, or speaking who, who happens to work for the federal government. So um, my, my remarks today are um, my personal opinion. I am speaking on behalf of myself as Valerie Teeter. I'm not speaking on behalf of the commission, the commissioners or um, commission staff more broadly. Um, so please keep that in mind. Um, also, um, I don't believe we'll touch on any uh, pending matters before the commission today, but, it, but in, in the uh, instance that we do, I am not able to comment on those, um, nor can I comment about timing of any commission actions. Um, so just some, some quick disclaimers. Um, now to kind of move into the meat of today's presentation, um, the first thing that I wanted to do is just uh, note really quickly what the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission does. Um, many on this uh, uh, webinar probably are familiar with FERC. Um, but for those who aren't relevant to today's discussion, FERC is the federal regulator that regulates the terms, 
rates and conditions um, for wholesale power sales. So sales, for example, between utilities or between a generator and a utility will, who will then resell power to its customers, um, as well as the transmission of electricity and interstate commerce. So I won't go into the difference between transmission and distribution today, other than to say that the transmission are the large lines that um, are used to, again, trans, uh, transmit power, for example, um, between states. Um, although within states as well. Uh, just to, to note too, um, what is it that FERC looks at when it's determining what constitutes a just and reasonable uh, a rate term or condition? Um, we're really looking at whether or not those rates, terms, and conditions are just and reasonable and not unduly discriminatory. So that's kind of the, um, the core of what FERC does. Um, and if you'd like any more information, please feel free to reach out and I can direct you to the appropriate um, part of FERC's website to learn a little bit more about who we are and what we do. So um, what I wanted to do today was just share a couple of thoughts on some major initiatives that the commission is currently involved in um, that I think relate to the topics that we're talking about today. FERC has recognized that the resource mix is changing. Um, and historically, FERC has been very aware of the fact that um, when you have new resources, new technologies entering the market, uh, FERC really has a role in ensuring that rates remain just and reasonable by making sure that there aren't unduly discriminatory barriers that may be restricting these technologies or limiting their ability to participate in FERC jurisdictional markets. Um, so I wanted to touch on two proceedings today. The first is far more relevant, I think, to the research that Katie and Kiara have done. So I'll try to kind of emphasize that. Um, but I, I think I would be, be going amiss if I didn't uh, recognize some of the work that FERC is also doing in the transmission space, which isn't as much energy market, but is nonetheless very important um, to, uh, to, again, acknowledging uh, changes in the resource mix. Um, so what I wanted to talk about briefly were just some conferences, uh, what we call technical conferences, that the Commission hosted um, last fall, fall of 2021, regarding energy and ancillary service markets. And at a very high level, the goal of these technical conferences was to explore the need for potential um, additional operational flexibility in organized markets, which we refer to as RTOs and, and ISOs. Um, why operational flexibility? Well, the reason behind that was explained in a white paper uh, that FERC staff issued in the docket before the technical conferences. And really what FERC staff did there is explain that in a lot of these RTOs and ISOs, there are discussions going on with stakeholders and among the, the market operators of how do we design these markets to address net load? You know, historically, um, energy markets and ancillary service markets has been very focused on serving peak load and peak load um, was was defined as, you know, the amount of load on the system at peak when there's the most load. Um, we are moving with the integration of new resources, particularly variable energy resources, to a state where I think there's more focus on net load now than there used to be. And what net load is, is it's your load, it's demand. Um, minus any non-dispatchable generation. So variable energy resources that can't react necessarily when the grid operator says, I need you to ramp up um, to produce more power. And so with this new focus on net load, we've seen you know, some regions have had some very drastic changes in net load over a day. And what that's meant for markets is that they have to be able to respond to those changes to make sure that they can reliably serve load. And one way to respond with the, to those changes are to have more resources or to assure that resources um, that are able to provide operational flexibility that can ramp up quickly, ramp down quickly in response to changes in net load um, are, are incorporated into the markets, so that there aren't barriers um, to their participation. And so that was really a, a big focus of these technical conferences, or do we have a problem here? Should we be thinking more in terms of net load? What does that look like? Um, a lot of the discussion focused around different mechanisms that operators can uh, deploy to try to, um, to try to provide this additional operational flexibility or again, to remove barriers to it. Um, one construct is an operating reserve demand curve. 
Um, basically, this is where instead of having a set amount of operating reserves, uh, you are willing to procure different amounts of operating reserves at different prices. Um, there was also a lot of discussion about new market products to address operational flexibility needs. And I, I think a lot of the discussion focused around something called a ramp product. Um, basically, the idea here is that you have resources that can very quickly respond to dispatch instructions to ramp up. Um, say, for example, if you have a, a lot of variable energy resources um, coming offline because the wind died down, or to ramp down if you have wind picking up. Um, you want resources that are able to ramp down quickly so that that low marginal cost, um, pretty much zero marginal cost wind uh, can be serving load. And so these ramping products are, are an idea that a lot of um, RTOs, ISOs have looked at. Um, and then again, just, just kind of thinking more holistically rather than these particular products, are there market designs that can incent resources to reflect their operational flexibility in their offers? So just because a resource is flexible doesn't mean that it has to offer that flexibility into the market. So you want to make sure that the market design provides an incentive for those resources to really make use of their operational flexibilities. Um, and then I think another question throughout was we also have some new and emerging resource types. Storage is a great example um, that they have a lot of operational flexibility. So how do we maximize the opportunities um, for these resources to provide this operational flexibility? Again, are there barriers to their participation uh, that we should be revisiting when we look at market designs. Um, I did want to share with everybody, this is an ongoing proceeding. It's a generic proceeding. Comments uh, on the technical conferences are actually due tomorrow, um, with reply comments due in March, on March 7th, I believe. Um, if you're interested, again, there is a, a system on FERC called eLibrary. If you put in the docket number AD21-10, you can find the agendas, the transcripts, speaker materials, um, and all the comments that we've gotten to date. So again, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out, and I'd be happy to um, direct you to the uh, appropriate place on FERC's website to, to find these materials. So the other proceeding I wanted to briefly note again um, is, is just right now FERC has got out what is called an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, which is a document it issues um, on occasion before it's decided it needs a rule change, um, with the goal being to better understand whether or not reforms to transmission planning and cost allocation and generator interconnection processes are necessary. Um, and, and something that, that FERC really understands is, is driving the potential need for reform is um, the change in the resource mix. Um, you know, historically for, for anticipated future generation, um, the way planning has worked is that usually those, those new resources on the system put in an interconnection request and then the incremental um, upgrades to the transmission system necessary to facilitate that interconnection, necessary to allow that, that generator to provide energy, um, are really handled through something called the interconnection process. I think in, in this docket, um, the commission really is exploring whether or not that's an approach that we need to think about, whether or not there might be merit in doing um, more long-term planning um, that really looks at what anticipated future generation may be coming and, and how do you incorporate that into the planning process. Um, in fact, there was a technical conference in November of last year um, that went kind of into more detail about what that type of long-term planning could look like. Um, you know, items that were discussed were, you know, should you be using future scenarios to do your planning? If you're using future scenarios, what are the factors you should be looking at? Um, how do you decide what anticipated future generation could be there? Um, how do you incorporate those future scenarios into regional transmission planning processes? Where did they kind of fit in existing processes? What information could they provide? And then finally, there was some exploration of whether it would be um, it would be appropriate to try to identify geographic zones where you know that there will be high penetrations of resources in the future. Um, and then if it is appropriate to look for those zones, how do you identify what transmission is needed to better integrate those zones um, with the transmission system? Um, it was a very interesting technical conference. Again, if there's interest in this topic, I would be happy to um, direct you to the appropriate place on FERC's website to learn more um, about not only the, the docket document itself, the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, but also the many thoughtful comments and reply comments that the commission has received uh, in response, um, as well as materials from the technical conference. Um, so that is my presentation today. Again, I really do want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak, and I'm happy to answer questions. 
Thanks so much, Valerie. Uh, before we dive in, just a reminder to keep putting your great questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, and just wanted to say out loud, it's in the chat, but the papers and the recording um, will be on both EDF and Policy Integrity's websites after the panel. Um, so Katie, let's start with a popular question from the audience. Can you talk a little more about the implications of your work um, for policy supporting batteries um, and sort of detail why um, batteries may increase emissions? Happily, it's really hard to fit everything into five minutes and that was the glaring thing I didn't have room for. Um, so first let me give an example of how batteries for frequency regulation could increase CO2 emissions, and then let me give some caveats to that example. So one example, imagine a battery enters to provide frequency regulation. And so now less frequency regulation is needed from fossil generators who conventionally would have provided that frequency regulation. That might mean that coal-fired capacity is now opened up to participate in the energy market because it no longer needs to have that headroom to provide frequency regulation. And so more coal generation happens, therefore more CO2 emissions happen. So that's one example, that's a very simplified example, but basically if you use batteries to provide some other service, you may be opening up coal-fired capacity that would have been set aside for that other service instead. So now caveats, um, that is like that will happen if coal provides frequency regulation, which it has in some ISOs historically. But whether or not that actually happens, of course, depends on the fuel mix on the system, depends on marginal costs, you know, what fuel prices are in any given at any given point in time. Um, I'm sure that that will decrease over time as coal fired power plants retire, as we've seen massive numbers of retirements around the country. So that example I gave you is both overly simplified and like specific to a time and place in a particular fuel mix. Um, but this is exactly why we think that this kind of research is important. It's not necessarily intuitive at first glance why that would happen if a battery enters an ancillary service market. Um, but we show in our simulations and in our statistical results that that is a real world possibility. Um, and so we would encourage both regulators and academics to think going forward for the particular ISO and the conditions in that ISO, is this the kind of thing that one needs to worry about when they're bringing in a new technology or changing the way that they compensate resources um, for the different products that they provide? Thanks so much. And can you talk a little about the implications for other renewables besides batteries? Or... Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so you know the amount of wind and solar on the system may change the amount of frequency regulation that we need, for instance, or the way that we compensate frequency regulation. Um, and so, um, you know, again, it'll be specific to a time and place, and the um, you know the fuel mix in that system plus the way that the renewables change what the regulator thinks they need from frequency regulation. Um, so. I think there's also a short term versus long term point that I didn't talk about before that's worth noting. Um, if changes to regulation markets then impact re plant retirements or new builds, you could get that the short run CO2 implications are very different from the long run CO2 implications. And the four of us have another paper that shows this with simulation results that you can get either increases or decreases in the short run and then the sign can flip in the long run depending on how retirements are affected. Um, so I'll put the link up to that in the chat. Um, but again, we just we would encourage researchers and regulators to you know carefully consider for batteries, for wind, for solar, if you're fiddling with ancillary service markets, what's that going to do to generation markets? Thanks. Um, Kiara, I want to turn to your work. Um, your study looked at um, whether using intraday markets could address some of the uncertainty from wind forecasts, um, but concluded that it might not result in more efficient power system operations. But there are intraday markets that exist in Europe and some of the other RTOs. Can you talk a little about um, how those markets differ and if there's any lessons to be learned? Sure. <clears throat> so I'll start with the with the European markets. Um, so the, the major difference between the EU and US market design is basically the degree of separation uh, between the roles of the market operator and the system operator. 
Um, in the United States, the integration of physical constraints and the clearing process and the involvement of the ISO in the market is probably as significant as possible. And so the, the ISO oversees both activities, market and system operations. And like I mentioned probably very briefly in my talk, when you, when you run these models uh, that, that set and, and the market clearing price, you actually take into account all the physical constraints of the network and the generator constraints. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the model that is currently used in the European uh, states uh, is what we call the the PX approach. And this was originally aimed at a, at a simpler consideration of the physical reality, um, along with a major decoupling of the system operator's responsibility and the spot market functioning. So the intraday markets that, that I showed in, in the Iberian case, those are truly forward markets um, that where again, the complexities of the network are not taken into account. And it, it's just a matter of retrading the financial positions uh, until we get close to, uh, to the real time. Now in the US, um, most um, ISOs have a two settlement structure. The only ISO that has a three settlement structure is the California ISO. Um, California ISO decided a few years ago to introduce this 15 minute um, market, the FMM, um, that um, is, is closer uh, to, to real time, and, and the prices from the FMM actually come from the 15 minute ahead um, uh, real time unit commitment. So this is the only, and, and I mean, what, why does this differ from the other intraday processes that are in the US? Because this one produces financially binding prices that are, that are used for settlement. So this is the only example in the US of, of, of an intraday market. But the difference between this construct and what we're considering is that we're truly looking at hours in advance because the idea is that the sooner the system operator becomes aware of the need to change the schedule, the better it is. So it's not as close as to the real time as, as we currently have right now. Thanks, that's a helpful explanation. Um, there are other options for integrating wind resources. You looked at intraday markets, um, but MISO has introduced and implemented a dispatchable intermittent resource category um, as a way to integrate variable renewables. Can you tell us a little about the MISO DIR and how it differs from what you're considering? Sure, so, so this is, um, DIRs is something that MISO introduced um, about 10 years ago in 2011. Prior to the implementation of the IR, a significant amount of self-scheduled wind capacity contributed to transmission congestion. And uh, if, if with no way, with no way of economically curtailing wind during times of congestion, the grid operators were forced to manually call wind operators and tell them to, to turn off. So with the introduction of this new DIR resource designation in, in about 10 years ago, MISO wanted to find a way to integrate these previously self-scheduled wind resources into the economic dispatch and the wholesale market. And one of the, the key things was that um, these, resource were, these resources were made to bid into the real-time market and they were made dispatchable uh, downward. Um, now, this has been a, a great way for MISO to reduce the number of manual curtailments and to integrate these wind resources much better. And now these wind resources can provide flexibility um, to, to the grid operator, which clearly results in, in economic and more economic and reliable grid operations. But I would say that there are a couple of differences with what we're doing in, in this project. Uh, the first one is that we are looking again at timeframes that um, consider hours in advance, hours before the real-time market, whereas the DIRs are, um, um, uh, this, is a, this is a construct in the real-time market. So the, any potential deviation from the day ahead schedule is known fairly in, 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 a, in a fairly short time frame, fairly shortly before real time. But if the system operator was notified hours in advance, 
maybe they could have time to adjust the output of inflexible resources more economically. And again, I wanna emphasize here the need to provide financially binding prices that, that give economic incentives to actually improve the accuracy. So I would say that DIR is different because it doesn't quite capture the different value and time of these energy deviations the way in, in the same way in which we're trying to do to do it in the multi-settlement design. The second question, the second difference I would say is, um, is with the wind forecasts. Um, my understanding is that DIRs may update their forecast maximum limit, which is pretty, it reflects pretty much the expected real-time capability for each hour and bounce the DIR real-time offer upward. Now, the wind unit is not required to update this um, FML in real time. And in fact, again, my understanding is that MISO maintains a default FML for each and every unit in case the wind did not submit an updated FML. So this is fundamentally different from what we're proposing in the intraday schedule because in the intraday market, because the goal there is to exactly to provide economic signals to incentivize the market participants to improve their forecast accuracy and use those new forecasts into their bids. And, and so in, in that case, the improved forecasts would be used into the bids and, and they, would not be, um, they would not be just something that the wind farm is able to provide if they're willing to do so. So that's a big difference. Thanks for that explanation, super helpful. Um, Valerie, I wanna to turn to you as our regulator. Um, you mentioned the two big technical conferences that commission, the, the commission has hosted. Um, are these the venues through which research um, like Katie and Kiara's are brought to the attention of the commission? How can stakeholders like, effectively um, bring this, this research to their attention? Valerie, I think you're on mute. Valerie, if you're speaking, can't hear you. <clears throat> oh. Apologies, I lost my connection. <laughs> That's okay. Did you hear the question or do you want me to repeat? I did not, apologies. <laughs> um, so I was just asking about the technical conferences. Um, are these the appropriate venues for stakeholders to bring information about research um, like Katie and Kiara's? Um, how can they effectively provide that information to the commission? I, I think these are the perfect types of opportunities. I mean, the technical conferences were really, we're really an attempt by the commission to get smart on these issues, to start exploring them, to kind of dive in deeper and understand where the needs are and whether or not there, there are barriers um, that should be considered or improvements to market design that should be considered. Um, so this type of research can be very informative to us. It's something that I think the commission is happy to get in, in comments. Um, commission staff you know, appreciates the ability to kind of dive into these issues, understand the, the technical thinking that's been done um, and, and have that, that thinking inform their decisions as, as, again, as they look at these problems, explore them, um, and identify really what the issue is, if any, um, that, that merits further explanation of solutions. Great. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to turn over to some of our questions from the audience. Um, you have all been right on in there. Um, so the first set of questions are for you, Valerie. Um, they're about designs that can reduce inflexible resources. So the first question is, what is the difference between a ramp product and a spinning reserve? Are ramp products currently included when a utility reports reserve generation? Um, on the reporting question, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, with respect to what's the difference, I think the difference between um, spinning reserves and ramp to me is really that ramp is um, specifically looking at providing either ramp up or ramp down. 
Um, and ramping products in some cases can be bi-directional. You can be procuring for both. But again, the idea is the quick movement. Spinning reserve is really more about a contingency. It's if something goes wrong on the system, right? So if a generator goes down unexpectedly and you need new generation to pick up and start providing energy quickly, um, it's if you have maybe a transmission line failure. Um, if you have some kind of contingency like that, that's when the reserves kick in, when there's an unexpected problem that pops up. Ramping doesn't have to be unexpected. It can be something where you know, um, as a system operator, say in California, you've got a lot of solar on your system and you know every day at sunset, you're gonna lose a lot of that behind the meter generation. The ramping product is there to deal with that variability. And again, it's, it's predictable. Is it completely predictable? No. Um, you know, you have, you have issues with forecasting where there are times when the wind doesn't blow as hard as you think or it blows harder than you think it's going to. Um, and, and I think ramp can come in, come in handy there too. But it's also for predictable things like I know as the sun sets, I'm going to lose solar. I need some other type of generation to be there to start ramping up. Um, so in my mind, that's really the big difference. Reserves are all about contingencies. They're about unexpected things that happen on the system where you lose generation for some reason or transmission for some reason, and you need generators to step up. Um, which generating resources can provide dispatchable energy with operational flexibility? Is it just gas, um, combined cycle? You know, gas is, is what you hear about a lot, combined cycle gas. Um, batteries provide a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, they, they, whether or not they participate in the ramping markets is a separate question, but they certainly um, provide a lot of services in the regulation markets because they can respond so quickly. Um, but it's, it's usually those resources that are able to ramp up and down fairly quickly in response to um, uh, signals from the market operator that are, that are there. So again, um, yeah, combined cycle gas is a big one, but there are other types of units. Um, batteries are, are definitely capable of doing it as well. Um, and we had a more specific question, is nuclear netted from total load or is it considered dispatchable? There's no standard for how you define net load. <laughs> so it's an excellent question. Typically it is not um, subtracted from load to get to net load. It's usually classified as a base load resource um, which is, is um, considered generation rather than again, non-dispatchable generation that is, that is um, is netted against load. Um, but again, there's no, there's no necessarily uh, um, hard and fast rule there. That's just the practice I've seen as, as I believe it's, it's usually, um, it, it usually is not netted from load, like say, for example, behind the meter solar would typically be. Um, I'm gonna pivot to a question, I think for all of you, um, both Katie and Kiara's paper really talk about um, these spillover effects and co-optimizing and thinking about the interactions between markets. Um, Policy Integrity's own work has actually looked at the interaction between capacity markets and energy markets in the context of buyer side market power um, and subsidies for um, resources that are provided by states. Um, why do you think that the literature isn't looking um, at these interactions between markets and the spillover effects? Um, and is there any implications that we can think about um, from either of your papers for capacity markets? I'll go first. Um, I think, you know, I had never looked at them before this paper. I have many other papers on electricity markets and I set those, you know, I set ancillary services aside. I think historically, like there wasn't a lot happening in them. And so to a first order approximation, one could sort of ignore them for lots of the most important policy relevant questions. Um, but it's precisely because the grid is changing that we need to be thinking more about this, um, about these interactions going forward. So, you know, I think the fact that we have largely ignored them up till now is, was probably fine, um, but we can't do it going forward at, as the grid is changing so quickly. And, you know, in as I said earlier, in the absence of nationwide climate policy to deal with carbon emissions from electricity markets, like this is exactly when you need to think about these unintended consequences because we're not pricing carbon emissions. And so when you fiddle with electricity markets, you get funny things happening with carbon emissions because they're not properly incentivized. Um, 
but also, you know, you talked about market power. So there are lots of other reasons like market failures in the electricity market, why you need to think about these things carefully because the market is not just going to automatically take care of it by itself. Um, and that's why we have great regulators and people at places like FERC. Anything else to add? Maybe if I, I'll just add uh, something just to, along the lines of what Katie was saying. I, I think for, for me, one of the most interesting parts of this project, the, the part of the analysis that we've done was the, uh, the addition of, of reserves. And this was not something that we planned on doing when we began this project, we thought we'd only be looking at energy. And then one of our reviewers, I remember they, they mentioned, why don't you consider reserves? I, I think that may give you interesting insights. And, and boy, that was that true? It was definitely true. We started it and we, we were running the analysis with just energy markets and we were getting one result. And when, once we added reserves, um, st things started to change. So, so I completely agree with what Katie mentioned. I think it's going to become more and more important to look at the combination of ancillary services with energy markets like we're doing in, in our project and, and with other markets um, as well. I can't think uh, right now about implications of this work that I'm doing for capacity markets, but, but, but probably there are. And so I, I think it'd be great for, for researchers in the audience to, to give that some thought. Great question. Um, and one last question, um, what is the role for demand response to provide a frequency regulation? Um, Katie, I think this, you know, are there any implications for your paper um, for, for demand response? Yeah, that's a really great question. We don't talk about it in this paper or in our follow-up paper on retirements, uh, but my co-author Johanna Matthew has a, has is like an expert in demand response stuff um, and has some interesting work on demand response for grid reliability things. Um, so I'd point you to her very long research agenda on her website. Thanks, hopefully uh, that's helpful for our audience members. Um, so I think we are just about out of time. So I'm going to throw it back to Virgin and thank you all so much for joining us today. This has been a great discussion. Thank you, Sarah. And I first want to thank all of our panelists for discussing their work and um, for Valerie for talking about what's going on at, at, at FERC. It definitely highlights all the exciting work um, that needs to be done, both academic-wise, um, academic research-wise, and policy-wise. I totally agree with Katie. There wasn't a lot, a lot of exciting things happening, but now there are a lot of exciting things happening things happening um, at these markets. And we definitely have a lot of um, you know, questions to work through um, in terms of a future research agenda. I also want to thank our um, attendees uh, for a lively discussion. We know that we couldn't get to all of your questions, but we hope to continue these uh, conversations and we hope to be um, you know, engaging more of these discussions um, uh, in the future and please feel free to email our panelists or me or Bea Spiller. We, uh, we have websites for the event and EDF also has a separate website for the event series where you can find links to the, today's presentations, the recordings, as well as the, um, the links to um, the, the researchers. So um, please look at those websites and please be on the lookout for the next webinar, which is going to be on the effects of different distributed energy resources on distribution networks. And we're going to, again, have an amazing um, cast of um, academic researchers and a policymaker discussing you know, the latest, uh, latest research. You can subscribe to our new newsletter or follow us on social media to be informed about um, all these events and we definitely look um, forward to that. With that, I'm going to thank you again and have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.